Good morning. Good morning. I am so glad to have all of you here today. Before we actually get into worship, hey, Zach, come on down. He's the next contestant on The Price is Right. You can tell what I used to do when I wasn't in college class. So uh, Zach is a part of the leadership of our building committee, and they have been meeting, and he has been kind enough to come in and share with us where we're at so far. Leading is a misnomer. It's I'm the guy you blame, I think, uh, and I'm the guy who didn't say no to Marshall. So uh, watch out for those things. So there's a couple folks in the building committee here, so please keep me honest. Uh, we've been meeting for a couple of months now, and we've met with Mike West's architecture team. Uh, the, the goals are, one thing is we want Roger to be part of the, the sanctuary again instead of the cameraman. So we want to redo the AV for, for streaming and so we can record services. It's long overdue. Uh, I personally am kind of tired of looking at these empty holes in the wall uh, where there used to be big, giant, old-school cameras. So we want to do this better. Uh, we want to refresh this room because I think most of the rest of the church is older and has all been remodeled. And this room, it's, it's this room's turn. It's time to make this look a little nicer, cleaner, and bring it into, you know, the 2020s. Uh, and so one of the things, that, there's a couple things we agree on. Uh, we all agree that these chairs are insufficient, so we got to do something different with seating. We don't like this. We're, we've nicknamed it the airplane fuselage. If you have a better nickname, please let me know. Um, there's nothing inside there, and I think it's, it used to be for controlling the sound in the room, and there's modern ways to do this without having an airplane parked in the room. So we think this can completely go away. That's going to open the room up. We think this ceiling can come up a little bit. There's a bunch of different stuff we're talking about. We want to make this, this altar stage area um, more open, more usable, and more accessible. Um, and I think one of the reasons that Marshall preaches right here is because he's not in a cage back there. That, that thing's kind of a cage. So we're going to fix that. We want to make that better uh, for a lot of reasons. And then one thing that's really important to the committee is these bathrooms over here aren't ADA compliant. They're not handicap accessible. And I don't have any problem using them, but it's not all about me. It's about the congregation. So we're trying to think of things for the next 20 to 50 years we're looking at what other churches are doing that are growing, uh, and we're, you know, a little bit not necessarily plagiarizing, but we're looking at good ideas and trying to sort those out. So those are things we're thinking about. Um, we really want to make this a nice worship space. Uh, those are our priorities, and I'm the guy you can blame if you don't like anything we do. <laughs> and then if you're on the building committee, give me a wave. Um, you know, there's, okay, so there's a bunch of you here. So this is a good thing to call out because we've got people from both services, We've got people on the committee who have been here different lengths of time, members of the church, which is really great for me because I get to hear all the stuff that happened 20, 30 years ago before I joined, and a lot of it's really valuable and useful. So we're, we, we're sorting out what are the good ideas, and we're getting to the point where now it's tar time to start figuring out what the budget's going to look like, and that becomes a much more fun conversation after that. So let us know if you want to know more. If you have uh, feedback, one of the things we've been doing on purpose is moving the tables around to see where people sit and what people do, because we have this open room now, and it's an opportunity to, to play and experiment and see what we make better and what we make worse and learn from it. So uh, that's why you're seeing tables over here this week, and you didn't last week see any tables in here at all. Uh, we're we're goofing around with it on purpose. So hopefully that's not too, too much of an inconvenience to all of you. Uh, we're noticing the families tend more toward the tables than the chair seating. And I've got little kids, so um, we like to give them room to eat a donut and color or whatever. So thanks. I'm going to stop rambling now and hand it off to our youth folks. The young Thank you, Zach. Hey, um, we, we do want to just welcome you today, whether you're online or here in person. Um, we're just going to take a moment and let ourselves settle and let Joanne play for us. And uh, we'll come back at it in a minute.
So good morning again. We really are glad you're here. Um, hopefully you guys have had a chance to grab a donut or some coffee. How many of you guys have had a cup of coffee or some hot drink this morning? Okay, so so a few of you. Th those of you that have, I you know, I just want you to know that you are in good company. Um, Moses of old, in the scriptures, he, he had coffee every morning. He brewed it. He brewed it. See, I got the, I got the groan from John, so er, er, all is good. All is good. Um, hey, you guys, let us pray together um, our opening prayer up on the screen. God, whom we call love. You welcome us into this time of worship and remind us that this world, this place, and this moment belong to you. You welcome us as strangers and travelers on a journey we do not always want or understand. You ask that we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort those who mourn. God, we ask that as we learn and grow and attempt to serve you, and others, we will be given the grace to love you and our neighbor in all that we do. We pray that at the end of each day, we can say that those to whom love is a stranger will have found in each of us generous friends. Amen. Hey, so we do have a few announcements. I know Sarah's got a quick update on the Linton project for us. Money. <laughs> Money. Did you hear that one? Wait, stay here, guys. Hold on. Oh, okay, they're going to start. We're ready to start. You guys go ahead. You know, there's no holding them back. Um, we do have an exciting announcement. Woohoo, good job. Um, last Sunday, we met our goal and then some. We were ho shooting for $1,000. And um, if you remember last Sunday, we were at $850. But by the end of last week, we were at $2,651, which is really exciting. I know, right? And not only did uh, we exceed our, our original goal, it was also able to be tripled because we got it in by the end of March. But we said we're committed to this project through Easter. So our new goal is $3,000. So we're so excited that this is um, working out, that we're able to help families in poverty through Heifer International. So thank you all for your help with it. And kids, thank you so much for collecting. You can give your buckets to Miss Louise. Good job. Here, Graham, will you hand this to her too for me? Can we give it to her? Okay, uh, our next announcement is, is that uh, this week we have Mission Kids. It's the first Sunday of the month. It's Wednesday at 6.30. Dinner is included. We're still working on our project to help create um, bedding mats, bedrolls for um, houseless friends um, through... Um, what's the organization? Somebody help me. Open Door, thank you. Um, so that is this Wednesday at 6.30, and kids um, second grade and older can come and be dropped off, and second grade and un under can come with an adult. So um, hope you'll join us. And then the last announcement I have, which is a very exciting announcement, we have an Easter egg hunt happening Saturday, April 16th at 10 a.m. here on our front lawn. We are... We are welcoming our neighbors to this event. Last year we had a lot of neighbors join us and um, we would love um, you to join us as well. Bring your grandkids, bring your kids. Come, it's gonna be a really fun event. And Louise is gonna tell us a little bit more. I didn't want you to miss me. Here you go, Miss Louise. So wouldn't you love to put a, wouldn't you love to put a smile on a child's face? Or better yet, just make it so that they can laugh with just pure joy. Well, I've got that opportunity for you to do both. Um, last year, we had over 100 children at um, the Easter egg hunt. We're expecting a lot more than that. Obviously, that takes helping hands. We've been fortunate that our wonderful youth group uh, members have been filling Easter eggs for us. Lots of Easter eggs. Um, but we need help on the day of the event. 
We need folks that are willing to come and help us between 8 and 9.30 with setup and decorating. We need folks at, um, that will actually work the event itself from uh, like 9.30 to 11.30, and then folks to come about 11.30 to help us clean up so that we can be ready for Easter services on Sunday. You play a big part in our ability to make this a successful event. There are three ways that you can let us know that, hey, I want to be a part of that. You can call Sarah and then tell her where you want to help, set up the event or clean up. You can email her at the church here. Or for those of you that are here in person, I have these obnoxious pink cards. There's some on each of the welcome tables back there, and obviously I have some in my hand. If you want to just write your name on it, um, a phone number or an email address so we can confirm with you, and then what you would like to do. We need a number of people to volunteer, so anything you can do would be appreciated. Again, you're the ones that are going to make this successful, and it is a wonderful, wonderful event. Thanks. Louise, where, where can we get bunny ears like that? <laughs> All right. Great. Hey, you guys, uh, just a couple of other quick announcements. Um, the flower fundraiser continues for our, our youth fundraiser. So we're, we're um, offering flowers for, for purchase in the back. There's forms in the, in the back, and you can find out all the information about that. Um, you guys remember Marshall mentioned a couple of weeks ago about the QR code that's in your bulletin. If you're having problems seeing what's on the screen or if it's just too small or whatever the reason is, there's a couple of ways you can still get the announcements. Scan your camera over the QR code and it should pull them up for you. Um, it's just an easier, simpler way to, uh, to find out and keep in front of you what the church announcements are for the week. And then Roger's been kind enough to uh, include them also on a uh, monitor on the, one of the back tables. So when you're in the back getting your coffee or donut later, go ahead and check that out. So thank you. Our first hymn this morning is number 366, Take My Life and Let It Be. So let's grab our hymnals. Number 366, Take My Life and Let It Be. First and third verses, verses one and three. We come now to that time in our worship service as we have gathered together as friends and family, share our joys and our concerns with one another this day. So what joys would we share with each other today? This week we get to meet our almost 18-month-old great-grandson for the first time. Well, have fun. Boy, COVID kind of messed with everything, didn't? Have a good time. He's almost old enough to drive. 
Oh, just coming out of our development, the yellow forsythia is in full bloom. The yellow like, forsythia is in they're full bloom. They're bushes. They're okay. bushes, yeah. Very nice. You can tell how green my thumb is, but I do like when it turns green. A woman um, from my home church in St. Cloud, Minnesota, who is like another pseudo mom uh, to me, um, her and her family were involved in my life and her daughters were babysitters for us, but she was one of the original seven women allowed to compete in the Boston Marathon legally in 1972, and she will be running uh, on Marathon Monday, um, August, or April 18th, and um, her story was featured uh, at the local news station in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and she's just a, a wonderful soul, um, and I never knew this about her at all until the story aired, so... Um, it's just inspirational and a reminder that um, we didn't always have the opportunity to run, so not taking that for granted. Absolutely. We celebrate and recognize the journey that others have forged for us. Other, other joys we would share today. Well, last week we celebrated our 55th wedding anniversary and we did it by making a trip to Michigan and had all four of our kids together for the first time since 19... 19... Well, if you start at 19, it's been a while because yeah. this is 2022, 19, so anything that starts with 19 is... 1998 or 9, something like that. So it's been a few days. Well, congratulations and we're glad the family got together. Other, other joys we would share this morning. I'll come around this way, Al. In my school district that I teach at, we have statewide assessment tests this next week, but tomorrow we're gonna have a kickoff by having the staff make pancakes and sausage to feed our kids as a kickoff. Now, they were smart and told me I couldn't make pancakes because they know they have heard of my cooking ability, so that's a joy too. Strangely enough, I'm not allowed in the kitchen either, Al. I don't know what that means about either of us. Other joys we would share. How about concerns? Are there any concerns that are weighing in on our hearts and our minds? And Janet, I'm going to come around and follow the same path. For those that aren't aware, um, I have been dealing with a uh, severe COVID COVID, <laughs> not COVID, severe vertigo situation where, uh, and they don't know what is causing it yet or anything, and we never know when it's going to hit or, or you know, but it'll, it'll lay me out for several days usually after it hits. So I just would like prayers for helping me with that, please. And uh, I mean, it, it all of a sudden hit the beginning of March. And we don't know why. We have no idea why. So We're thank gonna, you for the prayers. Absolutely. We'll continue praying for you, Janet. Other concerns that we would share today? If not, let's just take our, this moment then. Center in in our own meditative way to share our thoughts and our feelings with our God. After that, I will offer up a pastoral prayer. And as we traditionally do, we'll bring this time of prayer to close with that which Jesus has taught us. Let's take this moment now. God of all creation, you created each one of us, touched each one of us and said, you are good. Each one of us, God, and for that, we are all so grateful, recognizing that you have made us exactly the way you would have us be, just perfect in that way. Help us, gracious God, to hang on to who you have called and created us to be, to tune out the noise of the world that 
enters negative words, in negative thoughts, anything negative into our life, trying to take us away from you, we will continue, gracious God, to stay focused on you, knowing that no matter where we go, no matter where we are, you are with us, telling us we are good. We have shared our, our joys, gracious God, not only with one another, but with you. We've also shared the concerns that are in our hearts and are on our minds, and we take this time because of our belief in the attitude of prayer and giving all to you. We know that giving those to you, you hear us. Help us to, to live into your time, gracious God, with whatever answer you give us. And in this moment, we now join our voices together in that which your son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite us to take this moment now to stand up and greet those around us, shall we? Good morning again. <laughs> Good morning. I'm going to invite us to find our ways back to our seats, if you could, please. Would like to share just a, a quick thought in terms of our stewardship time. You know, last week we, we stood up as a, a congregation and we said, you know what, we have an opportunity to have an impact around the world. Our children led us into the opportunity of Heifer International to make sure not only one was purchased, but to triple whatever it was we could raise funds for. When we raised almost $2,700, that got tripled, okay? That's the children leading us in what we do to be faithful stewards of what God calls us to be. And for that, we thank the children and I thank each one of you. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to you, Sarah, if you would be reading, please. Our scripture this morning is from Philippians 3, 10 through 14. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him 
in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Well, I always like to start off with something funny. And I heard about this church, small church. That they had a house for the pastor. It was right next to the, the church. But the house was looking, you know, kind of wore down. Needed a new coat of paint on it. And so trustees got together, started talking about it, decided they were going to paint that house. And the janitor volunteered to paint the house. Trustees were not going to argue with someone volunteering to paint the house for them. Janitor went about painting the house. House looked, house looked great. But you know when you have something that looks really great sitting next to something that looks good, but it could look better? You know what happens, right? They started talking about, well, as good as the house looks, the church probably needs to look just as good. And they went to the janitor, and they, they asked him, they said, do you think you would be willing to paint the church just like you did with the house? He said, sure, be happy to. He goes, I actually got too much paint for the house, so this works out great for all of us. So he started. Painted the first quarter of the church, the outside, and got to looking at the number of cans of paint it took to do that versus the number of cans of paint he had and thought it was going to get to. and started to worry he may not have enough. So an idea struck him. What he decided to do to kind of help get that paint a little farther along is he added a little paint thinner to that paint. Certain that just a little extra paint thinner would definitely get him done with the building. And he got that, that second quarter done, but he realized a little bit of paint thinner yeah, it wasn't going to be enough. He was running low on paint. So he added even more paint thinner to that next group of paint. And he got the third wall done, and he was really starting to sweat some bullets because he went to the fourth wall, and he had more paint thinner than he had paint that he was putting on that, that last wall. But, you know, he was just getting done. You know, he's doing that last little touch-up coat spot on the, on the last little corner. And as he was doing that, he hadn't noticed these large, dark clouds that started to roll over the top of him. And as he stood back to admire his handiwork on the church, a loud clap of thunder went off and rain began to just pour out of the sky. And he watched as that paint-thinned paint just washed right off of his church. All the work, all the effort gone, and he just sat there trying to figure out, what next? What is it I'm supposed to do? And he no sooner thought that than a word came from heaven, and it said, repaint and thin no more. <laughs> yeah, at least you got something to take home. If It's a groan, all right, yeah. I did hear a, a true life story of a pastor who went with a, a friend of his to a high school football game. His friend had a son who was a linebacker, you know, played on that defensive side of the ball. And they sat there for most of the game talking about it, watching it, seeing his son, you know, got in there, made a couple tackles. But as we all know, playing linebacker, you usually don't get to touch the ball. You know, it usually doesn't come your way. And then it happened. As the two men are sitting there talking, the, the other team's punter goes out and goes to kick it, only he takes it right off the side of his foot, shanked it. I mean, just, just plain old kicked it about five yards. But he kicked it right to this man's son, the, the linebacker, who never touched the ball before, and he, he catches the ball. 
and he takes about a half a step to the left, and he takes about a half a step to the right, and he looks up, and it looks like all 10 of the other team are coming to tackle him and a couple of cheerleaders. I mean, they all just buried him right there in the spot. He didn't move that ball forward an inch. I mean, he just was there. And the pastor was sitting there trying to think of something positive to say, you know? And he was trying to think of something. He was, try he, he, he was just drawing a blank. There wasn't, he, he just couldn't think of anything to say to, to make this a positive situation. I mean, the young man got buried right where he caught the ball. And as he's sitting there in this awkward silence, all of a sudden the dad elbows him in the side and he goes, do you see that, Pastor? Do you see the two great moves my son made? A half a step to the left, a half a step to the right. As parents will, we, we find things that we are positive about and we can, we can lift up about those who are important in our circle. But the thing about the world is, is the world would much rather hit us with negativity would try to, to tear us down, pull us down, try to, to make us less than. You know, we, we all have things in our minds that are supposed to happen at a certain time and in a certain way. You know, maybe looking for a job, you, you think, okay, I've got X number of resumes I'm going to send out, and then within the next time I'm going to go on job interviews, and, and on the next point in the calendar I, I'll have a job. Well, we can control what goes out in the mail, right? But then we kind of got to wait for the phone calls, for the interviews, and maybe our timeline starts to get wonky, if you will, get weird. It, it starts to stretch out. We begin to get nervous even to have a res uh, an interview, and then and as our time keeps getting more and more stretched out, we get even more and more nervous, and we get more and more negative, thinking, you know what, maybe I'm not even going to get a job this way. And the world starts to echo those thoughts in our head. Well, maybe you're not going to get a job. Or maybe we have a, a timeline about our health and, and, and that's not working out. And we get negative about that. Or we have thoughts and timelines for our family and, and that's not happening the way we want. And we just kind of let all that negativity start to take over. Of course, then there's worry and, and there's doubt and there's guilt. And we just carry those just because they're there. You know, sometimes we worry because we don't have anything to worry about. And all of those things weigh us down and take away the, the positive that, of who God has created us to be. I heard someone once explain it like this. We're all kind of like containers. You know, when, when we come into the world, we, we come in with this joy and this creativity and this excitement and the knowledge of forgiveness and the knowledge of salvation and all these, all these wonderful things and then we let worry in to our container, and that pushes peace right out. And we let, we let guilt in, and that takes confidence, and it, it shoves that confidence right back out. And the next thing we know, this container that started out overflowing with positivity, overflowing with all these great ideas and thoughts, are now almost all negative. And we, we struggle to try and figure out what it is we're supposed to do. And, and in the midst of that, we use all of this emotional energy to hang on to the negative. We hang on to those grudges. We hang on to those, I'm never going to forgive, finish the sentence. Because we'll see that person or we'll see that place or we'll experience that moment. And we just, we use all of our emotional energy on the negative. But God created us to be positive and not worry about the negative, but to use all of that emotional energy to be who God's created us to be, to live our dreams, to fulfill our goals, to live into whatever it is that is positive in our lives, to stay focused on the positive. In the Gospels, there's a story of a, of a woman who for almost all her life was dealing with a bleeding situation. Had gone to every doctor, done everything she thought she could, still was dealing with it. Got to be older in her life, and she stayed believing, though, that she would be healed, and she heard that Jesus was walking through her town. 
And she knew that if all she did was touch the hem of his robe, the hem, not his arm, not his back, not some other larger piece of his clothing, the hem. If she could just touch the hem of his clothing, she would be healed. Believed it, had positiveness about it, had faith that that would happen. And as Jesus was coming through, she got her way in and she did. She reached out and she touched the hem of his cloak. Scripture says as soon as she did that, Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? Now, the disciples looked at him and said, you're kidding, right? We got people crushing in all around us, and you want to know who touched you? There are a lot of people touching you. And he turns around, and he sees the woman, and he acknowledges her faith and her positivity and exclaims that she is healthy and whole. She stayed positive. You know what really, really uh, amazes me about positive people? is the impact they have on negative people. You ever watch it? When you come in and you know that you're about to deal with some people who were negative because you know who they are, and you go walking in and you start talking about how great the day is because you know they don't think it is, and you tell them how great this was, or you tell them how great that was, all they're wanting to do is talk about the negative. And they're listening to you, and we're having fun, right? Because we're just talking about all the positive, knowing that we're kind of driving them crazy, hopefully in a positive way. But that is what we are called to do, to focus on the positive, to stay moving in and to understand that we are to share that, that greatness of God, the blessings of God, the promise and the hope. We need to either be positive or we just need to go home. There was a guy by the name of Zachariah. His son might recognize his name a little more readily, John the Baptist, okay? Before John the Baptist was coming into the world, the angel came to Zachariah and said, Zachariah, you and your wife are gonna have a baby. Now, the positive thing would have been for Zachariah to say, that's great, that's wonderful news, that's exciting, I'm so thankful. Instead, what does Zacharias say? Well, how can that be? You see how old I am. In that moment, Scripture says Zacharias' mouth was closed for the next nine months. Zacharias' wife was happy for a multitude of reasons. But the fear was that if he was allowed to continue to talk, he would spread negativity. This was supposed to be a great thing, an uplifting thing, a positive thing. Stay focused on that. Now, yeah, we all get those moments, don't we? We all have those moments where we think, you know what, that person said that mean thing to me. I'm, I'm going to respond. And in that moment, we get caught up in the negative. Is that really who God calls us to be? Is that really what we're supposed to be about? Can I invite us to think about, rather than focusing on the negative, we do like what Paul does in the scripture, talking about staying focused on the goal, talking about moving forward in that positive way. Can I invite you to think about it from about three different ways, okay? First way is, when you wake up in the morning, Say to God, thank you. Thank you for the day. Thank you for the breath we breathe. Then tell God that we're grateful. We're grateful for being alive. We're grateful for our opportunities. We are grateful for and pick whatever those grateful things are, but to share those things that we are grateful for and then end that prayer with promising to make it the best day because God has created it for us. Start by simply waking up in the morning and being positive. It's not like that joke, sometimes I wake up grumpy and sometimes I let them sleep, you know? <laughs> wake up positive, stay focused there. Second, don't wait to change. Change now. Don't say, well, when something good happens, then I'll become positive. When I was a junior in college, I was working at the Havelock United Methodist Church. 
thinking about being a pastor. And the minister who was there at the time said, well, Matt, if you really want to be a pastor, you probably should preach a sermon. I said, okay. And we started working on it and got it all ready. And, and Sunday came and it was my turn to preach. And I want to show you approximately how it looked as if you were sitting in the sanctuary in Havelock and I was preaching. It looked a little something like this. I did not look up the entire time I was preaching. Now, I had a choice to make. I could have said, well, you know, that didn't work out so good. Maybe there's something else. But you know what? Everybody who walked through shook my hand and told me I had a, I'd done a good job, probably hoping I would do better next time. <laughs> but you know, I just chose to accept it. I chose to take it. You all get to decide where my preachings ended up. You do not need to tell me that right now. But you know, that's our opportunity. Don't wait for the change. Just make the change. Finally, take on I am statements. When Moses was talking to God in the burning bush, Moses said, well, who was going to send me? God said, tell them I am who I am sent you. When you look in the mirror, remember that you are a child of God. You are talented. You are perfectly made. You are forgiven. You are grace-filled. You are... Pick those positive things that you know that God has created you to be and say those things to yourself. Wire your mind to remember. I am who God has created me to be, and I am perfect that way. Amen. I have time this morning, and seeing how I get to do communion, we're going to do it a little bit old school. Will you grab your hymnals with me, please? We're going to turn to page 9. If you will turn with me to page, page 9, we're going to join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. 
Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. To your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Those who will be helping me with communion, if you would come forward at this time, please. And as they're doing that, I would remind us again that on that night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, gave it to his disciples, and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many. Amen. As we prepare to receive communion this morning, I'd first like to share that this is an open table. All are welcome to come and to receive communion. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't have to be a member of the United Methodist Church. All are welcome to come and receive communion. We have that which is gluten-free so that you can have communion. We also use grape juice to make sure that all are welcome. Here in just a moment, we're going to invite you to come forward and to receive communion. For those of you who would like, please stay in your seats. We will bring communion to you. I would ask that you would allow me to serve our servers, and then the invitation will be extended. communion a little bit differently today. Today we are going to be doing it by intention. We're going back to that old school way where we tear it off and we place that piece in your hands. would ask that you would then take it and dip it into the cup and then receive communion this morning. Please come and receive communion this morning.
Our closing hymn this morning in our hymnals is number 701. When we all get to heaven, we're going to sing verses 1 and 4 of hymn 701, When We All Get to Heaven. our worship service to a close I'm going to remind us right after the benediction we are going to sing one more time number 667 Shalom so in your hymnals we will be singing one more time number 667 we're going to sing through that one twice and then after we've sung that Joanne will give us our beautiful postlude so let us join our voices together in our benediction now let us go in peace to live a faith that matters to grow in the love of God, and to serve wherever we are led. Let us join our voices in Shalom, number 667.